Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're going to be getting going very quickly here. So we'll just give it a few more seconds, I think, to have people join us. And then we'll get started. Great. Welcome to the Archival Landscape Series, everyone. My name is Ellen Engseth, and I'm a member of the steering committee for the International Archival Affairs section of the Society of American Archivists. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. I'll in start with a, some introductory comments and introduce our speaker today. Archival Landscapes is a virtual seminar series of the International Archival Affairs section of the Society of American Archivists. In each seminar, an international guest speaker introduces participants to the issues and advancements in their local context, describing the history, operating environment, and unique aspects of archival practice in their country. The seminar series is hosted by the Graduate School of Library and Information Studies at Queens College, City University of New York. Please note that this seminar is being recorded and will be made available on the Society of American Archivists YouTube channel. Today's seminar will look at the archival landscape in Poland. We are joined by Dr. Madalina Wisniewska Drewnesz. Dr. Wisniewska Drewnesz is an assistant professor, academic teacher and researcher at the Faculty of History, Nicholas Copernicus University in Toruni, Poland. At the same university, she graduated from archival science and records management with bachelor's and master's degrees and defended her doctoral thesis on community archives in Poland, on which she published a book entitled, Otherwise It Disappears, Community Archives in Poland, Multiple Case Study in 2019. Apart from community archives, her areas of interest are archival theory, archival science methodology, arrangement and description, oh, excuse me, and new trends in archival research. Currently, she teaches courses on archival arrangement and description, community archives, international archival landscape, and introduction to archives for international students. After the presentation, there will be a Q&A. We'll leave about 15 to 20 minutes for that. So please put any questions you have in the chat and we'll be sure to try to get to them. Thank you all for joining us and thank you, Magdalena. Thank you very much, Ellen, for the introduction and many thanks to James Lowry, who decided to uh, invite me to take part in this seminar. I'm very glad to uh, familiarize you a little bit with the uh, archival landscape in Poland. So let me share my presentation with you. Um, okay, so um, again, my name is Magdalena wisniewska Brewniak. I am from Nikolaus Copernicus University in Toruń uh, in Poland. Here on the slide, you can see my email address, my Twitter account, and my uh, personal website address uh, if you would like to uh, get in touch with me. Um, Today, I will tell you um, about this general idea of the uh, archival landscape uh, in Poland. Okay, um, so this is more or less the contents list of the presentation. First, I would like to tell you some general information about Poland. Uh, then uh, the history of Poland and especially the history of its archives. Um, then about contemporary ar archival institutions that uh, are in Poland, not all of them, but the most important types. Um, I will tell you also something about archival education, professional archival education, and then I made a short list of the hottest archival issues um, currently discussed uh, by uh, archival scholars and by uh, professional archivists. So some general introductory information. Um, on the map, you can see uh, how Poland situates on a map of the European continent. 
and on the map of the European Union as well, because Poland is uh, the member of the European Union. Um, the country has got around 38 million inhabitants. It is a democratic republic with the capital city uh, in Warsaw, in Polish Warszawa. Um, the, the, the official language is Polish, and it's the only official language in Poland, but we do have historical sources in uh, more languages, especially in Latin, in Russian, uh, and in German, and I will get to that um, uh, soon. Uh, the neighboring countries are clockwise, the small gray uh, piece in the northeast is Russia, uh, to be exact, the Kaliningrad Oblast, the westernmost federal subject of Russia, then Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, Slovakia, Czechia, and Germany. So the beginning of uh, the history of Poland usually starts with uh, the with the year 966 with the Christianization, and generally we tend to see the end of the 10th century in Poland as the beginning of Poland as a state. This was the moment when also first dioceses, first Catholic dioceses, were um, created. So uh, the archives and of bishops and archives of monasteries uh, started to grow. And in this period of time, there was the slow introduction of writing to state administration, but uh, slow, definitely. But from this period of time, we do not have um, any uh, documents that survived the, to this date. Um, the 12th and the 13th century um, was the period where uh, monasteries developed. The second half of the 12th century and the 13th century was the moment where more um, were using the document, the written document became uh, more frequent. Uh, in the second half of the 13th century, we have got town settlements, um, which uh, well, th th in this moment they did increased in numbers. So, um, uh, oh, and local princes also. The, these uh, factors should be um, also enlisted here. They were those counterparts of feudal lords. Uh, in Western Europe. So at this time, we can see three main so-called archival factors. So three types of entities that held archives in this period, which were church entities, so bishops and uh, monasteries, then towns, and then local princes. Um, in the 14th century, we've got the formation of the monarchy and its central and territorial administration. Uh, for the, the, the development of the judiciary system, uh, further uh, urban settlements, um, but also um, the phenomenon of granting goods by the monarch, so uh, lands and privileges to private persons, so also legal deeds owned by private individuals uh, started to form a kind of uh, archival entities. Um, at this time, paper began to replace parchment as a writing material. And um, also in the 14th century, we can see uh, in the Polish lands first uses of registers instead of only using charters and uh, diplomas, not only parchment, um, documents were created, but also uh, books as registers of uh, documents. Um, in this period, the records of offices uh, were not considered public property, but were still seen the property of uh, the official that held particular office. So this is why many documents found their way to the private archives of noble families. Um, it was only at the turn of the 15th and the 16th centuries that the concept of public archives uh, became established, but still records, uh, documents appeared in family archives even in the uh, mid 18th century. 
So uh, the turn of the 15th and the 16th century was the moment where um, the concept of public ownership of archives of judicial records uh, emerged. Um, archives started to be seen as public property. Um, this was strictly connected to the democracy of the noble, which was the political system of the 15th and 16th centuries in the Kingdom of Poland, then the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Uh, generally, it guaranteed the right to vote and decide on state affairs to the noble masses. And thanks to the privileges issued by the king, uh, the nobility were the owners and administrators of the court records, and the court books performed notarial functions in relation to the nobility as the ruling group of the republic. Uh, each nobleman had free access to the book, but not in a contemporary sense of free access to archives, but um, they, we, they did not have direct access to the books, but each nobleman could get a certified extract from the books um, as well as he could enter his protest. Uh, votum separatum uh, or an entry just for memory. Generally, any document could be entered into the books. Um, what is also important, laws um, from the king, from the parliament or local parliaments also had to be published in the books, um, entered into the books. They were the form of this publication. Um, in this period also, the archive of the monarch started to be seen as the archive of the crown, so um, not of uh, the king personally. Um, here's a map of this Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, so a country um, created in 1569 by the real union between um, Poland and Lithuania. Uh, I'm showing this in order to um, stress the fact that we still share a lot of history and cultural heritage um, from that period with, for example, Lithuania, Belarus, Latvia, Estonia, uh, and Ukraine. And this is a nice image of this act of the union in Lublin from 1569 with almost 80 seals written on parchment currently uh, preserved by the Central Archives of Historical Records in Warsaw. Um, the 17th century brought no major reforms and development, nothing very interesting from the point of view of history of, of administration uh, happened, but the second half of the 18th century was much more interesting. It was a period in, um, it was the period of many political reforms, also some, administ some administrative uh, reforms. Um, in this period, there was the beginning of the process of concentration of archives. Um, and new type of offices and new types of records started to be used. It was so-called records of activity, this is the direct translation. Um, this means that um, previously book registers uh, contained the content of particular documents, and now the books recorded uh, activities taken by the office. That was the, the main difference. Um, a very interesting and very complicated time in the history of Polish archives is the long 19th century. Um, this is the period we call it the partition of Poland, when the territory of Poland was uh, divided and um, became part of three neighboring uh, empires. Um, the, on, on the map, the pink color states uh, for um, territories um, that was that were annexed by the Russian Empire. Uh, green is uh, for the Habsburg Empire, and blue is for the Kingdom of Prussia. And um, this meant that at this time, three different office systems were in use on the Polish lands. 
uh, three different languages of records were used, which were German, Russian, and Polish for some parts and for some periods of time. Uh, and the most important part about the archival development in the long 19th century is that archival institutions were developed as part of three different systems of archival administrations. And I don't want to get too much into details because believe me, it is a bit complicated. Um, after the, uh, the First World War, Poland regained uh, independence in 1918, and we call this period the Second Republic. The First Republic was this democratic uh, republic of the noble. Um, so in this period, archival network was developed first. Um, for first time in history, it was the Polish uh, archival network, um, but specialists in this uh, uh, in this time had to unify the three different office systems. It was very uh, big problem for archives uh, and for records managers. Let's call them uh, in the Second Republic. Uh, Second Republic. Also extensive works on archival theory and methodology were conducted. Um, this is when Polish archival science as a discipline was born. Um, also uh, in 1927, the first issue of the uh, Polish archival journal Archeion was issued. Um, it is published to this day with a break for the World War II. They resumed uh, um, publishing the journal in 1948 after the World War II. And uh, right now, the publisher of this journal and the head editor is the general director of state uh, archives. And in the Second Republic also, uh, 1930s, uh, is an interesting period of time when it comes to the history of uh, bureaucracy and administration because a lot of attempts to improve the office system of public administration, of public institutions, uh, were made. Um, the development of the Second Republic uh, and its archives was stopped by the World War II. Um, to be exact, uh, the, the beginning of the World War II in Europe, um, and a very important date for Poland, uh, is seen as the attack of the Nazi Germany on Poland on September 1st, uh, 1939. When it comes to the history of Polish archives, archives in this period, um, definitely the most important uh, thing is the loss of archives during the war. Um, it was, uh, first of all, the destruction of archives in the course of hostilities or by arson, so by accident or by um, um, well thought um, means of destruction. Secondly, uh, the destruction of current files in offices taken over by the Nazis and also illegal transports of materials, which on the basis of previous international treaties were owned by Poland. Um, also a trans some transfers of archival materials between archival institutions and between countries. Um, the, those, this phenomenon could also be observed, but apart from this, uh, some types of new records were created in this period. Um, first of all, the records uh, created by the occupying forces, uh, both Russian and German, then the records of Nazi concentration camps organized on the Polish lands uh, under um, the German occupation, then Jewish ghettos records, uh, and home army records. Uh, home army was the independent underground uh, military forces organized in order to um, fight the occupying forces during the Second World War. And an especially um, devastating example of losses of archival heritage during the war is definitely the Warsaw Uprising in 1944. Um, Relatively small losses 
uh, occurred during combat action, only about 20% of archives, um, but very large losses um, happened in September and in November uh, as part of deliberate destruction of archives by the Nazis. Um, and as far as I know, and this is how um, historians of archives in Poland state that those losses of archival materials in Warsaw in 1944 have never been recorded in history before. So this, um, uh, the, the, the magnitude of the losses. Um, to show you some examples, to, to show you how, how this, um, affected uh, archives in Warsaw. Uh, there were five uh, historical archives, archival institutions in Warsaw in that time. Um, three were nearly completely destroyed. Archive of New Records, Archive of the Enlightenment and the Treasury Archive. So very few materials remained from those three institutions. The so-called main archive was destroyed in about 90% and the historical records archive was destroyed in um, around 75%. Uh, in addition, many objects of cultural heritage stored in museums, libraries, galleries, and in private collections were uh, destroyed or looted during the war. Um, also, after the war, the uh, territory of Poland shifted again. Uh, on the map, you can see um, the, the pink territory is the territory uh, after the war, after 1945. Uh, but when you will see on this gray line, the gray line indicates the territory of the Second Polish Republic, so before um, the war. As you can see, um, some significant changes to the borders uh, after 1945. Um, a big part of the archival heritage from the period of the first and the second Polish Republic was left behind the eastern border. Uh, then in the Soviet Union, now uh, in Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine. Um, on the other hand, uh, the Western territories, which had not previously been part of the country, uh, were annexed to Poland. Uh, in these areas, the Polish archival service was set up anew. Uh, but the archivists still used um, the archives and, for example, the archival aids uh, from uh, German archivists. Um, so, after the World War II, what is important to note is that there have been some changes, some serious changes in the political system. It was the time of the communist uh, period uh, where uh, Poland was a totalitarian state ruled uh, by one only legal communist uh, party. Uh, when it comes to archives, um, there was a phenomenon of nationalization of industry and nationalization of land ownership. And as a result of this, uh, a lot of archives of uh, factories, uh, manufacturers, and of noble families who previously owned land, those archives were um, transferred to state archives. In, and in huge amounts in many cases. So uh, state archivists had to deal with um, archival description and arrangement, for example, uh, because this was a new type of archival fonts in state archives. Uh, also, they um, tried to reconstruct the, the archives after the war. Uh, archivists also attempted to recover archives illegally exported abroad using the um, restitution and repatriation of cultural goods. Um, this was also the pe a period of further development of the archival network um, and something that is very common for, uh, for different countries all around the globe, the mass production um, of records. 
Um, so, as I said, after the war, Poland um, was a satellite country of the Soviet Union. It was a communist party um, dependent, dependent from the Soviet Union um, economically and socially and politically in uh, any way, actually. Um, but also, uh, archives uh, suffered the influence of the uh, of the Soviet Union. Um, so the first influence was the centralization. So the archival services got centralized under one um, archival official, and each uh, state archive all over the country where uh, was subordinate to this one archival official. Um, archives had to serve the uh, science and economy of the country. Um, so historical records were practically used to develop the country and the industry. Um, this is not uh, very typical, I believe, for the Sovietization of archivistics, um, but uh, I think this is, uh, at least for Europe, uh, can be true for many countries, not particularly influenced by the Soviet archivistics. Uh, but also a phenomenon that should be uh, mentioned here is this objectivization of archival science, um, especially interesting in archival uh, appraisal practices. So uh, our, uh, as the matter of, as a, as a means of this philosophy, archives must contain the objective view of the world, an archivist must apprise and select records based on the scientific or objective criteria. And the general view, the meta narrative, is more important than particular views than the smaller narratives. And um, in many cases, um, not uh, as, as part of this appraisal practices, as a result of them. Uh, we do have preserved reports and summaries and uh, some general reports on some phenomenon instead of uh, case files that would directly speak about the phenomenon. Um, this image could be interesting for you. It is a propaganda poster. I hope you don't feel offended. It was a long time ago. Uh, the poster says, this is our enemy and the arrow points directly at Uncle Sam. I believe this is, um, he, he personifies the capitalism, which is obviously uh, the number one enemy uh, in a communist uh, country. Uh, archives were used as a means of propaganda during uh, this communist period, uh, especially archival exhibitions were used uh, in this purpose, for example, to convince the public about the Polishness of the Western lands. Uh, you remember on this map I showed you uh, that after the World War II, we lost some parts of the Eastern lands, but we gained some parts uh, on the West, and those parts on the West has not been very Polish before. So archives were used to indicate um, that, uh, well, to, to stress the Polish character of, um, of these lands. Um, Two big nationwide queries were organized um, in this Polish People's Republic period. Uh, these were about uh, history of the working class and history of farming farmers. Um, so there was some engagement uh, in that matter. Also, regional outreach was a very important uh, task. Uh, our archives served as centers of culture and research for their region. Uh, and they cooperated with schools and teachers and so on. Uh, from this period, we have got still um, the archival law from 1983. It's still in force. Um, it's provided us with the concept of national archival holding, something that is quite common in this post-Soviet or Soviet-influenced countries in Europe. Uh, so the idea is that the national archival holdings are all archival materials, um, no matter who produced or who possesses those materials, no matter what kind of materials they are. And the archival uh, law 
uh, encompasses this all national uh, archival holdings, although uh, the national archivist, the general uh, director of state uh, archives, has got uh, direct power only over the state parts of the national archival holdings, very few power over the non-state national archival holdings. Um, the fact that this law is still in force is a bit problematic because it was a different political system. Uh, in 1990, Poland became a fully democratic country with political pluralism, free market, free speech, and so on. And the, uh, the archival law has been amended many times uh, since its publication, and there are still some ongoing works on the new archival law. So I will now go to the types of Polish archives. Um, first, the state archives that have got several types. Actually, first are the state archives subordinate to the general director of state archives, then the so-called separate archives and archives with entrusted archival holdings. Um, then I will tell you a bit about community archives. Uh, also, there are church archives and university archives, and archival materials are also in um, libraries and museums. So when it comes to the state archive, there are sub subordinate to the general director of state archives, who is subordinate to the Minister of Culture, National Heritage and Sport. And these are archival materials from institutions run by the state and local government. This is how the network looks like. Um, there are three central archives in Warsaw and 30 local archives uh, all over the country. So when it comes to the central archives, um, the first one is the Central Archives of Historical Records. Um, they store records of central institutions created before 1918 and records of noble families of national importance. They uh, have no new accession, so this is a closed archives, more or less. Um, the archives of new records, uh, they preserve records of central institutions created after 1918 and archives of prominent politicians, social activists, scientists, artists, etc. from the 20th century. The third central archive is the National Digital Archives in Warsaw. They collect photographs, audio and video recordings, radio broadcasts, um, mostly created by the state. And they are also responsible for all IT solution in, solutions in state archive and their um, flagship project is the portal Szukaj w archiwach gov.pl, which is the um, main entry to uh, archival description in state archives in Poland. Uh, I encourage you to look it up. There is uh, the English version of the, of the website uh, also uh, available. So the second type was these were these separate archives. This is again the direct translation. These are archives that possess state records, but they are not subordinate to the general director of state archives. For example, these are uh, military archives, uh, archives of institutions responsible for national security, like the intelligence archives, uh, archives of the parliament, of president, of prime minister, and archives of ministries of foreign affairs and internal affairs. A special type of the separate archives, actually a network of separate archives, is the Institute of National Remembrance, in full, the Institute of National Remembers Commission of the Prosecution of Crimes Against the Polish Nation. Um, and they possess security services records from 1944 to 1990, records from courts, prosecu prosecutors' offices and prisons uh, on uh, individual repressed uh, for, political, for political reasons. Crimes, uh, they also have records of crimes of the Nazis and communists against Poles uh, from the 20th century. And part of the structure of the Institute are the archives, of course, but I, they also have the scrutiny office, 
which collects uh, and checks declaration from people who want to take a public office so they can prove they were not a part of the security communist apparatus before 1990. Uh, they also conduct research and perform a lot of outreach activities. And for example, they still prosecute criminals, um, criminal activities from the communist period. For example, um, dishonest uh, communist prosecutor working for political reasons uh, before 1990. And there are also these archives with entrusted archival holdings. Um, they are archives as part of institutions, but they possess both historical and current records. Usually these are universities, some universities, not all of them, uh, and other uh, research and cultural institutions. Typically they have administrative records, student records, um, academic and student organization records, uh, but also private, private archives uh, from professors. Um, also, the com community archives should be mentioned here. Um, in Poland, we use the term archiva społeczne, which is uh, not totally the same as community archives, but quite close. Uh, they are independent archives that document, uh, for example, minorities, local histories, uh, some events, professional communities, and so on, usually small and run uh, by volunteers. Um, interestingly, since 2020, we've had the Center for Community Archives uh, that is uh, co-organized by uh, a big foundation that also is a community archive, the Carta Center, and the Ministry of Culture. Um, they run a database of community archives in Poland. They organized uh, as far three congresses of community archives. They um, publish uh, stuff about community archives in Poland. They conduct research on community archives in Poland. They have the e-learning plat platform for non-professional professional archivists. Also, they organized workshops and uh, consultations for community archives. And they run the open system for archiving, which is a digital tool for describing um, archival materials uh, designed especially for community archives. So how, how I would like to tell you a little bit about how things end up in state archives. So uh, each state archive controls all state and local government institutions on a particular territory. Um, they control the well the, the regulations on record keeping uh, practices, but also keeping the current archives. Uh, some of these institutions produce archival materials, some of them not, but they are all to some level controlled by state archives. And um, they use this retention schedule. The retention schedule must be approved by particular uh, state archives. Um, in this retention schedule, there is also the indication whether a particular file or folder, folder should be uh, preserved uh, permanently or should be destroyed after some period of time. And there is a very pretty drawing of how things look like. Um, so those records uh, and all end up in the archive as part of the institution. And if it, in the retention schedule, it had this B5 category, it means that after five years, it can be destroyed. If the category was the, the A category, this indicated that these are archival materials and after 25 years of being preserved in this archive, it should be transferred to the state archives um, in, this, in, in this example, the state of archives in Zielona Góra. Uh, a word or two about archival education. We do not have a separate archival school, we've never had. Um, for many years, archival science practice was taught as a specialization in history curriculum. Since 2007, 
um, there was the first separate curriculum for archival science and records management at my alma mater, Nikolaus Kopernikus University in Torun. Now I believe we have got three at three universities um, archival science as a separate curriculum, but still uh, it is a part of history department. Uh, also, we have got professional courses for records managers and archivists in current archives. Uh, these are organized, for example, by professional associations. Um, but in general, the, the, pro the profession of an archivist is not regulated, but the profession of archival technician is regulated. And a bit only at the end of the hottest archival issues. Definitely number one, I would say this is the electronic document. Um, how it uh, influences both archival practice, um, archival technology, but also archival uh, methodology and uh, archival theory. Then the status of state archives and their functions. This is something I find very similar to Professor Popovici's uh, um, a seminar about archives in Romania. So state archives are, are not quite sure whether they are state offices or research centers or some education uh, venues. Also the status of arrangement and description. Um, I will tell you a bit about it on the, on the next slide. And collecting policies of state archives. Generally, um, there have been two, uh, two projects um, collecting projects organized by the state archives in recent years, um, the family archives and the archives of the pandemic. Um, perhaps this might be the beginning of state archives engaging more in uh, collecting policies instead of only accessioning um, records from uh, state and local government institutions. Also, digitization of the archival heritage and databases uh, and uh, generally IT solutions for um, managing archives. Also, I would say a um, very important archival issue right now is uh, the, the status of an archivist as a profession and also uh, how uh, well or unwell these professionals are remunerated and how this uh, the, the, the archival salary represents um, the respect for the profession in contrary to how much an archivist should know uh, about history, about administrative law and so on and so on. And uh, the last thing I would say, but this is a bit subjective perhaps because this is my area of expertise, uh, community archives and how uh, during last decade they uh, won their place in the uh, landscape of archival institutions in Poland. Um, I um, would like to tell you something about this um, arrangement and description a little bit, but I cannot show the next slide, sorry. Okay, um, so why the, the, the issue of arrangement and description is important? Um, in Poland, this is a set of practices established during the interwar period and shortly after the World War II. And generally, uh, processing archival funds in state archives uh, is very time consuming and in fact it ends with a monograph of the font. So it's not only a list of um, files or for folders with a short note about the creator, but it's like almost a book about the history of the creator, the history of the records, the characteristics of uh, the records with a very thorough analysis of the office system uh, and so on. Uh, so this is very time consuming and requires a lot of uh, professional knowledge and uh, still this is some kind of uh, struggle on how important um, this particular archival function is and uh, whether it should be changed, perhaps maybe archivists should not be so thorough uh, in this regard. 
And the last, um, the, the last thing I would like to share with you, um, there is this Polish Nas National Agency for Academic Exchange. It's called NAWA in Polish. If you would be interested in conducting some uh, research in Poland, uh, I would encourage you to visit the website. Um, also, feel free to contact me if you would like to uh, have some help. Perhaps I would like perhaps I will be able to uh, help you in any way. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Madalena. That was so interesting. And thank you for the invitation to uh, look at research with you and in your country. I'm also fascinated of how there are such similar joys and challenges to all of us in this profession around the world, uh, as different as our heritage is and um, our current situations are as well. So uh, you illuminated that very well, thank you. I think we'll start with questions in chat right away. Uh, we have a few there and everyone, please feel free to write them in. Looks like we have quite a few, so that's great. Um, first, Margarita asks, what kind of records document the working class and the farmer's history? You mentioned those two particulars in one of your periods. It's a very difficult question. I'm not sure if I will be able to answer that, but this was the um, idea of these queries organized um, during this period after the war to find out in which types of records historians might find uh, information about the working class and the farmer's history. So uh, I, I, I cannot answer you this question, sorry, but this was uh, all about the, the query. Right. This was the idea of the query to find out where those uh, information can be found because it was quite known that this is dispersed uh, information. So it can be found in different types of funds in different types of records. Thank you. And Bogdan asks, the concept of national archival heritage holdings was adopted after World War II in almost all Eastern European countries based on the Soviet influence. Does Poland adopt it only in 1983 or did a form of it exist even before then? Um, I believe in that the, uh, it happened fully uh, in the 1983. Uh, Archives Act. Before, uh, our, before that, we had the uh, Act from the 1951, I believe, but it did not implement this, this term. Uh, it's, uh, it was implemented only in the uh, 1983 archival law. Thank you. And a lot of people are expressing their thanks in the chat, in case you're not seeing that. Many, many thanks. And Scott asks, can you please speak more about your community archives work that you are currently focused on? Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, I've recently finished my works on community archives. So I'm still uh, trying to get back together with all the, all the other works, but probably I'm going to focus on the impact of community archives in Poland. And probably I will go on with, um, uh, with um, using, uh, for example, observation and uh, interviews to uh, get to know more about community archives in Poland, but because this is also very typical for um, a lot of uh, archivistics in Europe that we are so focused on being part of the history profession that we tend not to use um, research methods offered by different disciplines. So um, I think I will focus on uh, using uh, interviews and observations to conduct more research, but this time focusing on the impact of uh, community archives on uh, community archivists or on communities or on users of these archives. Um, so I would like to just look and see who is uh, in any way uh, impacted by uh, community archives and their works. 
Thank you. And I have a follow up question in your studies, either past or the future ones you're planning. Are you including your the independent archives and the social archives that you spoke of as as close cousins to what we call community archives? Uh, yes, definitely. I, I uh, focus on independent archives. Generally, we have got quite vast definition of community archives. Uh, I think this would be um, similar to perhaps the Canadian version of community archives, but I personally tend to focus more on independent uh, archives, archives run by uh, non-governmental organizations or uh, informal groups. Thank you. Um, and let's see, James asks, is your book available in English and where can we buy it? Uh, sadly, my book is available only in Polish. It is uh, in free access, so you can access it without uh, any payments. It's accessible in full, but it's only in Polish. But I can uh, give you a tip use Google Translate or any other automated translation because generally Polish and English translate quite well automatically. Okay, good to know. And um, by any, so that's an ebook, that's an online book? Yes, yes, it's uh, an, in PDF format uh, only, uh, I think, but still, well, you, you need to, um, uh, well side, by, well, side by side translate some interesting parts, uh, but I, I've, I've never thought about translating it into English yet. <laughs> yet, right. Yes. Thank, thank you. And let's see, we have more thanks. And Fiorella asks, thank you for your excellent pre pre presentation. I was wondering whether you might want to say something about the current political situation in Poland and any risks for archives. Um, well, I, I don't know how to sum up the political situation in Poland right now. Um, this is also something we share with Romania probably, so a populist right wing uh, party that is quite focused on using history to its own purposes. So uh, in this um, in this point of view, uh, state archives are not particularly endangered, though they can be used in, uh, in um, different ways, perhaps. Uh, but I would say uh, that community archives, at least some community archives, might feel at risk for example, archives that document um, uh, LGBT uh, minorities, LGBT community, for example. Um, they, I can tell you that they definitely will have problems with getting public funding. So this might be seen as some kind of uh, danger for them. But generally, uh, at least yet, I would not look at the uh, current political situation in Poland as directly threatening to uh, any type of, uh, of heritage. Thank you. Uh, also to mention, if anyone wishes to uh, unmute themselves and speak, you're very welcome to, or feel free to add another question into the chat. I have a question, if I may. Um, I was thinking about the vast losses of records during World War II suffered at, in your region and country. Are there recent or very current sharing and repatriation projects that you're aware of vis-a-vis -vis archival records? Uh, right now, uh, I think most of repatriation problems have been resolved already. Um, so uh, some repatriation uh, issues are still uh, tried to be resolved by the general director of state archives. So it's not, um, it's actually not a question of researching those stuff, but of um, organizing the, the, this thing politically and from the administrative point of view and so on, because uh, those losses and those 
illegal transitions and so on, they have been researched very well um, in this uh, after World War II period. So they are researched, but not of, all of them are uh, resolved. Usually for political reasons. I know we have got some issues with uh, Russian archives still, but perhaps they will never uh, be uh, returned to Poland. Thank you. And Greg asks, what is the state of archival decolonization in Poland? Is this a current area of research interest? Are there minority community archives pursuing this, for example? Um, so um, I believe this is about the decolonization in this broad sense, because, um, you know, Poland has never been a, a, a colonizing uh, entity, uh, but in this broader sense of decolonizing the archives, um, this is at very initial stages. Um, I was personally doing my own research, I have not published it yet, but uh, about um, the colonizing language used in the uh, archival descriptions, for example, for the um, minorities like Jews or the Romani people, and what kind of terminology is used uh, in, on, in official governmental state archival description, and this might be um, disturbing, um, but I don't know any other research. Uh, Thank you. And as a follow up, is that a topic in the classes that you teach and with your students? Uh, if decolonization is the topic? Okay. No, not, not yet. I don't not know what, what I would uh, teach them actually when it comes to, to, to Poland. And plus, this is uh, you, you, I think you all know this is uh, quite an complex phenomenon. I generally tend to uh, tell the, my classes uh, about this international landscape of archives because I present them with some uh, current archival, hottest archival issues from, uh, from uh, archival science, for example. So I tend to tell them about the decolonization of archives, but it's just a very small portion of the class. Thank you. And we have just a few minutes left. So uh, we have more thanks to express and to everyone attending. Thanks for being here and for engaging with your questions and your time. And Madalena, thank you so much. Have a thank great you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye everyone.